it, it's not the data that's weird. It's not the analysis that weird. It's the result. People do not like this result. They think it is very strange that uh, one can get more and more social progress with less and less energy use. This goes against what people are expecting. And so there's they're sort of an allergic reaction to this. It's not only an ecological crisis that we face, but a profound social crisis uh, that's characterized by very high levels of inequality that we face as well. And so addressing um, this double crisis is, is, is the objective of our project, but also should be the objective of, of progressive social movements uh, to understand the ecological and social dimensions together. Conservative analysts now or liberal analysts are saying, yeah, okay, this post-growth or the growth makes sense, but politically it's, it's, it's a non-starter. So, and it's such a huge change that we can't imagine it happening in the current liberal democracies where you can just get like marginal changes in this with a lot of sweat and then they are reversed. And it's true. I mean, this critique is very true. So we want to work with it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a, a socially just, systemic, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and today we have a very, very special episode that will explore how to escape from the growth economy and ensure social welfare and planetary uh, sustainability for all. Most of the people listening and watching to, to this podcast already are aware about the ecological crisis, the societal and the injustice crisis that we're facing right now, and how perpetual and uh, infinite economic growth, driven by GDP as the only indicator, is one of the systemic causes uh, behind all of that. Numerous scholars have proposed post-growth, donut economics, and a number of our visions for a desirable, just, and ecological restorative future. However, it is sometimes unclear how to make this possible, how to make this desirable future a reality. To explore how to develop a post-growth future, I have uh, the pleasure to talk with not one, but three fantastic guests, and I call them the trinity of degrowth or post-growth. Today with us, we have Julia Steinberger, professor of ecological economics from uh, Université de Lausanne, Jorgos Kalis, Professor of Ecological Economics and Political Ecology at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, and finally, Jason Hickel, Professor at the Social and Cultural Anthropology Department at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona as well. Together, they were awarded a ERC, so European Research Council um, Synergy Research and Action Project, entitled Post-Growth Deal, also between parentheses, real. So many of us are extremely excited and curious about this project. However, we cannot find too much of it online. And that's why we have this podcast episode today, so that you can tell us a bit more about it. Let's, let's leave it to there. With all that being said, Julia, Yorgos, Jason, thanks so much. And welcome back or welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks very much. Great. Um, so you have uh, this project, but before we dive in this project, I would like perhaps because there is the interdisciplinary element into it or transdisciplinary element to it, the Synergy Grant, uh, I would like perhaps for you to share with us how you arrived to post-growth because none of us uh, were born in this or started with post-growth as our academic um, endeavor. And you all come from different academic and research backgrounds. Um, you are interdisciplinary researchers as well. So Julia, you were a physicist back in the day, then industrial ecologist and now ecological economist, and you mix a number of them. Uh, Yorgos, you were an environmental engineer and you turned a political ecologist and ecological economist. And Jason, you're an economic anthropologist turned ecological economist as well. So perhaps I would like to take uh, a couple of minutes from each one of you to to tell what were some key turning points in your research career that told you, okay, post growth might be an important element to explore, and I would need to enrich it with other disciplines, uh, and not only the ones I was 
trained by. So perhaps, Julia, we can start with you and, and then we can move with your colleagues. Uh, th thanks, Alistair. And I, I think that this is a, why I was really uh, cringing and feeling quite unworthy when you mentioned this uh, horrible expression of the post faith trinity, because I came to this topic quite late, I think. Uh, I was doing industrial ecology and ecological economics. I was looking at where you could see decoupling or not decoupling or efficiency or rebound or those kinds of things. And I was not at all convinced about the necessity of degrowth or post-growth. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't say they were that I was against it. I just uh, was very um, um, uh, not not convinced of the necessity. I would put it that way. And I sort of had to convince myself through my own research and through the research of colleagues to the fact that this decoupling, this green growth, is not happening in reality. If you do see it, it's very partial and not fast enough, and that we need radical changes quite rapidly in order to put things to put ourselves on a on a safer trajectory. And so that's when I became um, really myself convinced and started paying a lot more attention to the work of people like Yorgos and Jason that I should have been paying attention to all along, perhaps, and 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 others as well. I mean, there, there, there's lots of really great researchers in this domain, like, you know, Matthias Schmelzer and all kinds of other people. So thanks. Uh, Yorgos, perhaps you would like to, how was your journey between becoming an environmental engineer? I think you were working on water back in the day. Um, and then perhaps you asked, what if we don't continue building more pipes or what was the, the journey there? Oh, it's too much water and I got drunk. <laughs> 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 I got bored of water, you know. <laughs> if you work on the same topic over and over, I, I was telling someone the other day, you know, at the end, not, not, I mean, not to, to, to brag, but, you know, if you work 10, 12 years on a very narrow topic, at some point you've listened to everything that can be said about, you've thought about it. And then you're just uh, becoming updated to the latest controversy, what has changed, you know, privatization, municipalization. <laughs> but the basic, the basic ideas are there. And then I felt uh, you feel you start feeling stuck. While with post growth or degrowth, mm -hmm. it's not the same because it's about everything. So you can never, you can never know uh, enough about it. You know, you can you can read and read and read from politics to to models to I mean, it includes everything. Um, no, the transition, I mean, came to me in the sense that when I arrived in Barcelona in 2008 to work with John Martinez Allier and his group that they were studying environmental conflicts uh, around the world, uh, one of the main figures of ecological economics, uh, John Martinez Allier, he wrote one of the first books, the, f the first meeting of the Society of Ecological Economics took place in Barcelona, 87, I think, or something like that. I got trained here in a summer school in 1999. I was just an environmental scientist, as you said, and then uh, I did. Uh, I came for for a different reason to a summer school here, and I was introduced to ecological economics, and I really liked it. And then I turned my PhD around ecological economics. So I was coming as a junior professor in uh, where I wanted to be. And around at the time that I came, uh, a little bit later, I think there was the first international conference on degrowth taking place in Paris, and most. Most of the students here and John went there. I didn't know what it was, and I, I don't know why I was bored of going to Paris. <laughs> so, so I didn't go. I think I was only well, the only person who didn't go. I was working in uh, empty corridors for a while, <laughs> and then everyone came back super excited, and it's like oh, I was very good, you know, etc. Uh, and then somehow I started reading about it. What was this conference on the growth? What is the growth? And it resonated with many ideas that I had. I mean, my postdoc at Berkeley was with Richard Norgard, who was a critic uh, of the idea of development, of unilinear development, of the idea economists understand development. And I was also trained in political ecology, which is, let's say, very broadly speaking, it's a Marxist and uh, Foucauldian critique of uh, capitalism. Uh, so th these were my two lines of training, but what I lacked, especially from political ecology and the whole Marxist critique, which I think is very incisive, but it was lacking a little bit uh, effort to formulate the alternative, to link to groups that demand different things. And that was what one could find in Barcelona, that there was much more engagement with social movements, with indigenous uh, groups, with mobilizations here in Catalonia. And then when this whole thing started being formulated around the concept of growth, uh, the concept of degrowth, the critique to economic growth, that is, I think, fundamental for ecological economics, I jumped on the train. So 
Of course, there has been numerous degrowth uh, and ecological economic uh, conferences since then. We're going to get back to the Beyond Growth Conference as well a bit later on. Uh, how about you, Jason? What was your journey in navigating these troubly waters? <laughs> well, for me, I came at it from... Um from world system research, which is what I was doing uh, in my prior life. I, I was based at LSE before, and I just finished a book. I was writing a book on global inequality and neo-colonial uh, structures in the world economy. Um, and I finished it, and I gave it. I gave the manuscript to a colleague, and he said, you should probably talk a little bit about the ecological crisis, since this is a big deal, and you should have some kind of reference to it now. So I started looking a little bit at flows of materials and emissions and energy and so on. And then I realized, wow, you can't tell the story of global inequality in the world system without paying attention to these, to like, like physical material flows. And I realized that, um, that uh, the way that the world economy operates is that growth in the global north um, depends on this massive extraction of materials and energy and embodied labor from the global south, which is deeply deleterious to their capacity to uh, to advance national development objectives and also you know offshores all the ecological damages and social damages uh, associated with northern growth um, and so this became fascinating for me and I really wanted to understand it more and and I discovered I discovered post growth as a result of this basically I started reading work uh, by people in the field and then I met Yorgos by chance in London who sat me down at a cafe in Russell Square and he was like, look, uh, you know, degrowth you part to... <laughs> one. Uh, yeah, let's yeah, start. He, to... <laughs> he was like, look, there are these ideas. You have to pay attention to them. So, and I, and I was like, I don't know if I'm totally convinced. <laughs> but uh, then I started reading and I thought, wow, this is a fascinating field that um, uh, is really like, I mean, really captivating and exciting. And, uh, and I felt I could contribute something with, uh, with a political economy kind of analysis. And that's, that's more or less what I've been doing. So I've, I've always come at the question of, degrowth from a kind of, let's call it a kind of anti-colonial perspective, I suppose. Um, uh, and that remains really interesting to me. Yeah, and I think that's what I enjoy very much with this field is that uh, it comes with layers of understanding. And even if I come from one particular, let's say, tr tradition of research, measuring flows and, uh, and stocks and stuff like that, I, I, I realize that I need to to relearn everything every time I discuss with another scholar in this field, which is so enriching. And perhaps we can use uh, just another question to discuss about the, um, the diagnosis before we dive in into the, um, the project. And in your case, uh, Jason, I think you, you just mentioned it. Um, you say that, um, well, of course, there is an intricate relationship between the um, relationship between inequality and ecological destruction uh, and how these are masked or caused by capitalism or new ways of colonialism. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, resource uh, plundering. You talk a lot about whose growth is it really or who is developing who. Um, uh, yeah, these are, of course, in, in your book, The, the, the Less is More. Um, do, do you want perhaps to to elaborate a bit further about how these relationship between the two, so ecological and societal um, streams are deeply rooted in the past. Um, and we, we are somehow in an in a inter, inter, interwoven system that does not allow to, to do one without the other. So even green growth yeah. will continue and push towards more inequality. Could, could you clarify a bit these elements? Yeah, I mean that's it's 500 years of history we're talking about. But I, guess, I guess very, I guess very briefly we could just say, look, I mean it's it's kind of apparent to all and very well established that um, that uh, that the industrial rise of the core economies in the world system uh, depended on a huge appropriation of resources and labor from the global south, right? Uh, for you know for most of the first several hundred years of of capitalism and. Then there was, of course, this incredible um, moment in the 20th century when uh, Global South countries, you know, fought and successfully managed to achieve, um, you know, independence from colonial power, and they began organizing their economies around uh, around human development objectives, you know, locally, 
uh, for the first time ensuring access to universal services and uh, nutritious food and decent wages, et cetera, et cetera. And this triggered this, uh, this crisis in the world system, right? Where it became more difficult for capital in the core to uh, achieve the rates of uh, expansion and return that they had enjoyed for so long into the colonial period, because suddenly resources in the global south are being mobilized around human needs rather than around servicing capital accumulation in the core. And so they responded with this, with a series of interventions, I mean, including, uh, um, you know, coups and invasions, but also structural adjustment programs, which sought to cheapen uh, labor and resources in the global south and reorganize production once again around servicing uh, northern accumulation, this time primarily through uh, global commodity chains where producers in the global south would, uh, would you know, uh, be generating technological goods and you know textiles and so on in sweatshops uh, for very very low prices. Um, and that's more or less the economy we live in today, which um, which is I mean th there's an incredible paradox I think we have to we have to pay attention to it, which is that um, the world economy is extremely productive, right? I mean more productive than anyone fifty or hundred years ago could ever have imagined, <laughs> and yet nonetheless huge portions of the human population live in deprivation, right? And most of that deprivation, of course, is in the global south, in the periphery of the world system. But even in the core economies, in the US, in the UK, et cetera, even in the European Union, there's extraordinary levels of deprivation. Uh, people can't make basic ends meet. They can't afford healthcare and housing, et cetera, et cetera. What's going on here, right? Uh, it seems to be a paradox. Um, and the reason, of course, is simply that, that under capitalism, the objective of production is to uh, maximize and accumulate profits, not to meet human needs, right? And so the result of, is, of course, a system that massively overuses resources um, and yet still fails to meet human needs. And this is deeply paradoxical. I think it's incredibly important to point out the fact that it's not only an ecological crisis that we face, but a profound social crisis uh, that's characterized by very high levels of inequality that we face as well. And so addressing um, this double crisis is 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 the objective of our project, but also should be the objective of of progressive social movements uh, to understand the ecological and social dimensions together. And of course, when we when we heard um, Ursula von der Leyen at the at the conference talking about this new uh, well, not new Green Deal, but all of this, we we can imagine signing treaties with Argentina on new. Uh, uh, supply chains of uh, critical materials and all that, we can, of course, imagine about future reconfigurations of neocolonialism and all of this. So, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll bookmark this. We can come back to it uh, in the um, in a future reference in, in the conversation. Um, Julia, you mentioned just before that you're at the beginning, you started looking at the relationship or kind of the decoupling, whether it existed or not. I remember... I think it was in 2014, uh, I saw a conference, uh, I was in a conference with you and you presented something about the HDI and material footprint, I think it was a scatter plot of, of the countries. And um, over there, you kind of saw that, well, there's no the strict relationship, the, the, the more footprint, the, the more uh, you, you will provide services or the more footprint, the more um, resource efficient you will be or or more GDP will be more resource efficient. So you kind of started to debunk or question these core assumptions that we had uh, five years beforehand, right? And uh, I'm wondering, uh, I also remember in our previous discussion that this was heavily dismissed back in the day, that this this was not well accepted, although you had hard data. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you perhaps share a bit this diagnosis? How, what were some of the steps and what you concluded back in the day uh, when comparing ecological components and social components? Yeah, so so it was probably, um, the data was probably not on the material footprint because I think that data became available internationally later. And I think Anka Shafartzik actually did some work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was looking at things like uh, carbon footprints. So uh, carbon within, um, tra trade corrected carbon with data from Glenn Peters. And I was looking at energy use, just like plain old energy use. And uh, and what was what's kind of interesting is like that that topic was not purely original. So one of the things I did is I was reading these old um, global energy development reports that uh, 
I think it was the United Nations Development Program had put together on energy and development that were super interesting. And I found this plot that showed that this relation between human development and energy was changing over time. And I was like, well, that's weird. And nobody's ever talked about that. And it was just this one plot and it wasn't published in peer review. And I don't only remember the guy's first name, which was Carlos, which is unfortunate. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, let's check that. And when I checked it, I found that it was true for basically any indicator of social progress you might want to find. And um, and so I was basically putting together what this this picture of both international and change over time. And the data was pretty simple. The analysis was pretty simple. I don't have a very complicated brain and it kept getting rejected. I think the paper got rejected six times and nothing changed over the course of it getting rejected, except it just got a bit more complicated because they're like, oh, you're doing population weighting of your data and we don't do that. And what if that changes? I'm like, I have to do with the, with population weighting and without population weighting. Anyways, the, the, nothing really changed. Uh, but finally, it did get published in Ecological Economics, thank God. And um, it was just sort of my first wake up call of like, OK, it, it's not the data that's weird. It's not the analysis that weird It's the result. People do not like this result. They think it is very strange that uh, one can get more and more social progress with less and less energy use. This goes against what people are expecting. And so they're, they're sort of an allergic reaction to this. But for me, so for me, that that made me think, OK, it's worth it's worth digging more and understanding what would be possible if we took this reality seriously. Because the other thing I thought was super strange and interesting was when you talk about this result to people, um, their reactions are, if they get it, their reactions are super weird. They're like, oh, okay, then everything's going to be fine. <laughs> it's like, it's not because it's possible to do better yeah. with lower resource use that we're actually going in that direction. Like there's massive inequality, there's massive deprivation, there's massive overconsumption. And we're going towards this, you know, this expansionist machine that Jason was talking about in terms of the capitalist world economy. And just because a better future is possible does not, you know, in the data corner somewhere does not mean that that's what we're actually doing. Like, why, why are you even thinking that? And that was another thing that made me realize that people are not understanding underlying power relations and they're not understanding what it takes for a good future to be realized. It's not just the possibility like that we exist in a, in an option space where we automatically seek out the best way forward. I think people think that maybe because of the economics education and indoctrination that we're supposed to be in an optimizing system or something. I don't understand it, but it made me understand both of these things that, uh, that, uh, that there were different pathways that weren't being explored, but also that people didn't realize what it would take for the, to, to really get system transformation to make those pathways realizable. And that sort of set me on my current track. Yeah. I, I can imagine. I mean, me, uh, a very naive engineer would also think this is a logical step. Like, uh, we have a, a theory we have a solution there we go someone just didn't read enough or didn't do the right policy so far and we're gonna do it and you know in a couple of years uh things gonna <laughs> uh, solve themselves uh naturally but of course we're gonna come into the well the orchestration and how the, the current uh, growth machine does not enable future alternatives um and i think over there that's transitioned smoothly to to you Jorgos, with well, your questioning of political and democratic aspects of flows and stocks. So in political ecology, tradition, uh, tra um, traditionally, we we don't, don't we don't know we don't look at numbers per se, but we under, we try to question the numbers, saying who gets access to those those flows, why do they get access to to these flows, where are these flows, and so you ask a number of other. Uh, questions in order to politicize, let's say, some of the more industrial ecology approach, which is just measuring stocks and flows, right? Was that some of the ways that you understood that, well, water per se uh, is highly political and the flows and stocks as well behind that? And who produces the numbers and the mm. metrics and what do the metrics uh, count and why? So, I mean, in, you know, when I was studying water, that was clear. I mean, you, the way what, what was defined as a drought, etc. Which for someone who who's not into technical stuff, you would think, okay, there must be some objective definition of drought that everyone agrees to, you know. But of course, it's not like that because the way drought is understood, it comes with a very particular understanding within which it is um, 
doesn't question the increase of demand. It, it, it naturalizes the problem as being just a matter of weather. I mean, there are all sorts of things and all sorts of decisions that they are taken on when do you, what do you define as an anomaly that then counts as a drought that actually they're very political decisions and which scientists um, tend to think they're apolitical. I mean, this happens also in conversations today about planetary boundaries, but also more relevant to us when we talk about the growth GDP. It's, it's an obvious indicator that has assumed power for the reasons it has that we can analyze historically, politically, economically. And it is a measure that it's uh, taken for granted what it means, but there, there have been huge um, simplifying conventions behind it that they were nothing but innocent or neutral. They had distributive consequences. I mean, you decide what you count and what you don't count. You don't count the the work conducted at home, mostly by women. Uh, you don't count uh, the loss of um, forests and clean air, etc. You only count the expenditures to clean it. Uh, the problems with GDP are well known, but even when they are well known, they are considered as like, oh, they, they did this mistake or, whoa, we could improve it and make better indicators. What political ecology brings to the picture is to understand why these things happen and why they persist. They are not just a matter of a technical mistake that some technicians haven't realized and some other technicians <laughs> are going to improve uh, in the future due to goodwill, you know? So uh, so when I started studying about the growth, the first thing I did is like to start, to, to start looking at the histories of GDP and growth. They are extremely interesting, you know, because you see all the debates that they were taking place in the 1930s and 40s when GDP was started being counted. How did they decide what is in, what is out? The political uh, struggles in the US Congress where the conservatives didn't want GDP actually <laughs> measured, which is interesting because they were they didn't want uh, private enterprises taxed and the, the Republicans, let's say, of the day. No? And, and they were afraid that by a better metric system of the whole economy, you would get a better picture of revenue also of private companies, you would tax them more. Uh, it was a government pro project, GDP, you know, so there was a lot of reaction to it from, let's say, anti-government uh, um, political factions. But then, of course, you know, there's the whole thing, what GDP measured, what not, then how did it get standardized at the international level? What abstractions took place there? How did it take place in the context of the Cold War with Soviet Union? How did Soviet Union try to measure its economy? How were then they were trying one to to overshoot the other in terms of uh, GDP growth, and that was linked to the military competition. So all the, all this stuff are political in the broad sense, you know. So to think about something, even I'm not talking about growth or capitalist growth, where it's obviously that's political. But even to think of the simple thing of how do we measure growth, which is a GDP, and it seems like a neutral, innocent number, and it's full of politics, of course. Uh, just before we move on, Julia, Jason, perhaps you don't know that, but uh, Yorgos, what's uh, do you have on your right hand? Is this the Amartis still? This one is Amartis, of course. Yeah, yeah but, but I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it a little bit too long for the <laughs> for the custom, the tradition. The tradition is by the end of March, you put it under a tree and then you make a wish. But I yeah. prefer to wait until July and August and celebrate my vacations by putting it in a tree, in a dry okay. tree by then, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Now we have the um, the considerations, the, the the diagnosis of the problem, right? We we are in an ecological and injustice crisis. Uh, both are caused by political choices, and it also means that we have alternatives. We don't necessarily need to uh, consume that much uh, to get to the same social outcome. So these are, let's say, how we triangulate the problem and then you fit them on a board and you say, okay, we need a project. 
Was this uh, during uh, the London, the famous London meeting between Yorgos and Jason, where you had coffee and they, you said we need a project, or who, who was behind it? I mean, you you wrote a number of articles already together in uh, post growth uh, um, scenarios, I think. Um, but what was the impetus behind this project? Who who kind of uh, pushed it? Yorgos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yorgos pushed it. I posted, but not as far back. When when Jason was too young and innocent, I didn't try to <laughs> to scare him too much. You know, he was yeah, full you, of energy at the time. <laughs> you lured him in with degrowth, and then once he, he he took the bait, then you you started yanking. He was living his bit. nice life in London. He wasn't he wasn't up for that. No, but the, the meeting in London was very far back. It was in 2015 or 14 or something like that. So the project we started working on it in 2000. 21, 22, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but at least uh, two years ago from now, we started working on it. So it was 2021. So it was, it was much later. I mean, yeah, Jason, as he said, the story, Jason got gradually into the growth. Then at some point, there was an opportunity for a professor scheme here in Barcelona. He came. And then within the overall thinking of how it can develop a research agenda, a research group here in Barcelona, but also internationally. Um, I was thinking of an individual ERC for myself, perhaps Jason for himself, uh, because here in Catalonia, there are also, as elsewhere in Europe, this type of grants are valued a lot in an academic trajectory, but they also give you the opportunity, you know, to build a team, build a long research agenda. So they are, they are welcome schemes, let's say, and useful. And then, yes. Uh, I, we were thinking of what team would we like to make and Julia was an obvious um, person to first contact and collaborate with because these are synergy grants and synergies, they they they, they put a lot of emphasis on the complementarity and on bringing the different uh, research expertise and agendas together. And I think uh, I and Jason cover uh, to one extent the, um, the political economic political ecolo ecological part of it but at different scales I'm, I'm more interested the, on the politics on the local politics on the movement politics Jason looks at the big international political economy between majority and minority world etc but then we lack let's say the necessary uh, technical skills to put the models in place to to really think of how uh, particular infrastructures in a post growth context would look like and also you know have also the real numbers and the real models that give us a picture of what an alternative future could look like so it was an obvious synergy between the three of us i mean you, you could have also other possible synergies but i think it was a uh, between more people it's not just the three of us so i don't think it's a trinity as you said i mean there are there are many many more capable and great people no and we are among them uh, but it was one good strong synergy and also there were good vibes from our first meeting so that was a, a good reason to continue working like that yeah i can imagine well, i mean so, i think in, sorry go on i think in general we just kind of realized that there's so much uh, additional research that we all want to do. <laughs> um, I mean, this this field is one of those things where, like, questions multiply, you know, <laughs> and, and new ideas are <laughs> are being born every day. And it feels like there's there's a lot that we want to discover, and uh, it pushes it's constantly pushing our horizons and inspiring our imaginations. And um, eventually, we felt like the resources that we had available to us in terms of our own time and uh, and so on, we're just not enough for us to be able to answer all the questions that we felt were important. And so the possibility of working together and building a big team uh, around around this research was just really, I mean, it, it felt like the right time, right? It felt like the right time uh, in terms of the trajectory of this field. Uh, um, and I'm very, I'm very grateful that it worked out because otherwise we'd only be able to answer a fraction of the questions that that inspire us and this is a, a real chance to to make a a broader contribution um i think in general also like both Jurgis and i were incredibly inspired by the kind of um empirical work that julia was doing um and uh i think the the potential of, of that kind of approach was was just so clear to us 
Uh, and I think that the, the project we put together um, is able to mix political economy and political ecology and, uh, and empirical modeling approaches in a really exciting way uh, that I hope will make a, yeah, a, a profound contribution. Yes, uh, I mean, just by reading it, it seems that also, you know, during the last five years, there was the, the foundations of works of your colleagues as well. I mean, apologies, yes, Trinity, perhaps it's not the right term, but, you know, I, I tried to find something, uh, uh, something catchy for, for this. But the idea was that you have so many colleagues as well that have built foundations that we are at a certain level that we can question and um, empirically test a number of fundamental ideas. And I think that we, uh, we have passed the idea test. So now I think more and more people agree with post-growth, more and more people are behind it. But we are now into this second phase of, uh, of post-growth where we kind of need more um, theoretical, empirical and applied elements to to make this a reality and i think that's where i i welcome very much your your transdisciplinary research and you say in i think in the ground that you have five pillars of post growth that you want to explore right uh so this time i didn't invent it you, you invented the, the five pillars uh let's start with one and i think the first one perhaps is also fits a lot with this empirical research of, of you julia where you say you want to explore and determine the planetary spaces of possibilities, modeling the use of resources needed to live decently, uh, and as a third point, to identify how we can have a convergence between North and South. Um, Julia, you have worked uh, on this for a couple of years now, on the provisioning of services and essential needs. Um, what is an excess? What is the right amount? What is decent? Uh, these are vast questions. Um, can you perhaps mention what are these, you know, provisioning, uh, well, provision of services and where do they fit in the puzzle? So provisioning systems actually has its own uh, third work package, right, which is work package three. So that's the, the third pillar. So are we discussing the first pillar, which is possibilities, or are we discussing the uh -huh. third one? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, because indeed, uh, when I saw the third one, I thought it was the counterpart of the first one. So the first one is more ideation or... What, what no, no, the, so the, the, the first one is, um, as far as I'm concerned, well, you know, so first of all, the five pillars and the five P's of post growth, <laughs> that was yours because he is the brains behind the operation. So he, <laughs> we need something catchy and cute. And I was like, really? And then it worked. <laughs> so I can't complain anymore. But I, you know, um, at first I was, I was unconvinced to say the least. But uh, so but five the, P's is because it's poo post growth you know so it's ah. <laughs> that's yeah. because well, then a friend of a friend of mine uh, who has a Marie Curie project that I mean the advisory board reminded me I have also all the five P's you know you took it from there and I said oh my god I forgot that <laughs> but there they were the five P's of something else you know so it's the magic There's only piece so many that's, uh... I mean the thing when I because my previous project was called Living Well Within Limits, and I had an advisory group already, and I emailed them, and I was like, you know, what do you think of these different project titles, blah blah blah, and they got back, you know, and they they answered, they all like Living Well Within Limits better, and then one of them, one of the a project actually had started at the first advisory board meeting, was like, do you know you stole that from Tim Jackson? He has a whole chapter on that, and for that he did for the Sustainability Commission. And I was like, dude. I asked you, you could have told me it was like, I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't mean to steal it from it. So I had to write this really embarrassing email to Tim Jackson saying, really, I, I'm I'm sorry about this. I, I can only apologize. Also, it's John O'Neill's fault because um, he should have told me. Um, so so the, the, the first, but going back to the project, the first P around possibilities is sort of an empirical package. So the, mo the, the thing that sort of ties things together in that one is that we're trying to basically lay the quantitative and qualitative groundwork around some of these post-growth ideas. So we're trying to lay out the big picture scenarios, we're trying to understand the material requirements, material labor, et cetera, requirements of well-being, um, do a whole bunch of footprinting. Um, and we are uh the there's two qualitative aspects around what are examples of degrowing or post-growing econ or flatlining or not low growth economies that what policies have they put into place to protect their population? What does that look like? So learning from those empirical examples and learning from empirical examples, for instance, during the pandemic of what are the, the, the economic activities and the sectors that are the most crucial 
to keep an economy going and to keep the population protected against again and then uh there's a sort of culminating that there's this idea that we would try to do overall uh, one of the most ambitious things we proposed to do in the project which is over um alternative uh uh integrated assessment model scenarios consistent with the post growth future and that's super ambitious and we have to see how far we get with that so we're we're working on it um but yeah that's a, that's a, that's that's already a stretch but that's what the first one does it's lay the empirical groundwork and sort of culminating in this idea of an overarching uh, alternative modeling pathway Yes, indeed. And um, I had uh, Lawrence uh, Kaiser as well on, on the podcast on integrated assessment models. And perhaps it's important to mention that none of the scenarios reviewed uh, by the C IPCC sorry, um, have a convergence between North and South. And I think this, is, this uh, opens up a, a, a million other possibilities and alternatives if you, you have another constraint, which is the one of convergence because right now we just have one constraint let's bring the uh, i don't know greenhouse gas emissions down to 1.5 degrees but of course now you and the possibilities they they are i don't know if they're narrower or or wider by adding more constraints i don't know if you when when you think about that uh, this possibility space uh, do do when when you think about it do you see it as a constraint one or as a abundant one I'm not going to say anything, given the fact that the man who wrote the book on limits is sitting in the. Yeah. <laughs> Yorgos, would you like to? No, the man who wrote about north-south convergence is also in the room, but he doesn't. He doesn't have it. <laughs> okay, I, I, it's I, the I game of hot something... potato. I see here. Yeah, yeah. I can say something about north-south convergence, and then if Yorgos wants to say something about <laughs> limits and abundance, that's cool. Um, no, look. <laughs> I mean, really, this has to be emphasized. Uh, the existing climate mitigation scenarios are deeply unjust, and this should trouble all of us in the sense that, look, they basically, they basically start with the assumption that the global North countries should continue to increase production every year for the rest of the century, right, growth, um, and maintain very high levels of energy use. And they square this uh, with the Paris Agreement targets um, by suppressing energy use in the global South. Uh, right. In some cases, suppressing it to below the levels that are required to meet uh, basic needs. Um, so this is like <laughs> this is deeply colonial, uh, and it's surprising to me actually. There's not a broader a broader discussion about this. I don't think the modelers necessarily intend like necessarily intended this, but it's certainly the way that it's come out. And mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the very urgent things we want to do is think about okay, what if we what if we take climate mitigation seriously, but also take uh, um, take uh, global inequality seriously and think about what's going to be required to ensure access to energy uh, um, to meet decent, uh, decent living needs for everyone on the planet. And I think that's really, I mean, it's interesting because basically what we see is that the, the so-called green growth scenarios are balanced on the backs of the world's poorest people. And this is unacceptable. And I think that like, we talk a lot about like the technical unfeasibility of green growth visions, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we have to also pay attention to the deep inequities that are at the heart of green growth visions. And once we confront that fact, then it becomes clear that a different kind of approach is needed. Uh, and this is what we're referring to, to as North-South convergence. Um, uh, uh, we have to increase energy use in the global South in order to meet uh, decent living standards very clearly. Um, but in the global North, uh, a significant reduction in energy use is going to have to be achieved even assuming like quite rapid technological change, <laughs> which we embrace by the way. Um, so, uh, so, we, so we need models and scenarios that pay attention to that. And that's one of the exciting things that we hope this project will do. You always, you want to bounce back on the, on the limits uh, element, abundance versus uh, limits and uh, what's that possibility, uh, well, space of possibilities. I didn't really understand, to be honest, the question, because I was paying attention to the North-South Convergence APCC, and then I heard some <laughs> words that seemed to be mine, but I didn't get the connection. <laughs> no, I was at the beginning, I was asking Julia whether the fact of constraining more, even further, um, the models and, you know, this uh, space by not only having an ecological limit, but also having a social limit, does that kind of pushes and... and and squeezes the the space of possibilities, or because we we take the shackles off of growth growthism, we we kind of unleash and and make the space of possibilities much larger than before. Is there a 
or how do you think about it? I mean, I also had a discussion with these two authors, uh, uh, Frederick Albert and uh, Carl Vinderlind, on the scarcity uh, book that they wrote, and I think this ties back on uh, inversely uh, proportionality than your limits book. So the scarcity and and limits or abundance and limits. What what are your thoughts about this? So I'm not sure if I have something wise to say. I, 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 <laughs> uh... No, I mean, I think the current system is producing scarcity all the time. So I don't think that these scenarios of non-convergence, uh, they are scenarios of abundance in any sense, right? So, uh, I mean, there, there are scenarios of continuous inequalities, continuous social deprivation for majority part of the planet even though they supposedly achieve with unrealistic assumptions uh, some kind of better climate future than would otherwise be the case. So I think our, our intention is to create scenarios that they are both socially acceptable and socially just and socially um, beneficial as well as climatically sustainable. I mean, it, here, I mean, I, I'm not someone who uses the donut. <laughs> I, I, I barely mentioned it, but now the way you framed it, it sounds to me like the donut. Now that there is like a social minimum that we have to, to achieve um, and also stay within <clears throat> certain uh, climatic thresholds. Um, and this social limit is a universal idea of everyone in this world being equal. So the goal the minimum part of the donut should be we should aspire to to a future where everyone in this planet has more or less the same you know there's no no justification whatsoever why to plan for futures where some people in some parts of the world by virtue of being born there or being born to rich parents there they will have like a thousand times more than people born somewhere else so that's that's a minimum, you know. I think that's that's a minimum goal, and that's how we treat it in our project. So we want to create models that incorporate this goal alongside, as you said, uh, climate goals. Um, and I think in so is it in this work package, uh, if I understand correctly, where you also look at existing case studies where this type of uh, lifestyles have been achieved, or w w I think. Julia, did I understand no, correctly? No, it's not lifestyles that saved. No, no, it's um, because I'm responsible for that. Uh -huh. This this first work package of possibilities was a little bit the package where we put all the interesting ideas we had and we <laughs> didn't know exactly where to put them. So the rest, I think the other package is a little bit, the other P's are more <laughs> consistent. The first P was a P for everything, you know, a knee really, not a P. Um, so yes, I, I had put there the interest to study the experience of low growth economies or no growth economies in the last year. So like to to be bold and st start trying to learn also from stagnation because stagnation, of course, is not post growth, but stagnation is stagnation. And we have, we cannot only think about post growth in the abstract, but also think and learn from what different people in different governments have tried in periods of uh, of where growth has not been possible to begin with. So that's the objective there. And we might get to study in more detail the experience of Japan the last 20 years, maybe the experience of a country like Cuba in the special period. I mean, these are examples that are often mentioned, but rarely studied uh, with this intention that we have here. Uh, and then the other was to, to reflect a little bit on what happened during the pandemic, you know, that, um, not because we want to close bars again <laughs> to avert climate change, because I think bars should remain open. Um, but because we want to, it was a very particular and special period where a very big part of the economy was put in hibernation. Uh, there was a very important distinction introduced that didn't exist before be between essential and non-essential sectors and services. Most of the times it was essential for capital, but at least as a distinction, it it is important because it speaks very much to our emphasis on human needs versus uh, 
superfluous types of production and consumption. No? And when you talk about essential and non-essential, it's this. So during the pandemic, not uh, intentionally, unintentionally, there was interesting experimentation of how do you hand handle the closing down of parts of the economy? How do you distinguish what you maintain and protect at all costs and what is superfluous and you can let go, you know, or you can do without it for a while? A very different context, of course, a virus, a social distancing and all these things. That's That has nothing to do with our scenarios of degrowth or of climate change. But as an approach, I think it, we should study it. I mean, it's, it's obviously something unique that happened. It's a social experiment of, of a big uh, scale. And before the pandemic, we couldn't think of what would it mean for the economy to under operate for one or two years you know now we have this thing it has happened so we should learn from it um we might come back to some other possibilities uh, in the future of the first p let's let's try to get to the second p which is i guess policy policy packages if i understand correctly um and of course over there these need to be contextualized and they will also be differentiated as well, what we need to add in our lives and what we need to remove from our lives. Um, we need to, to, to add well-being, we need to add care, we need to add a number of elements. And at the same time, we need to, to reduce, uh, phase out fossil fuels, substitute uh, some elements with some others. We need to cap, I guess, some resources. Um, so what are some of the elements that you envision in this uh, second P and who who uh, feels uh, particularly interested by developing these piece? I can talk really briefly about this. Yeah, I mean, I guess kind of the the uh, the centerpiece of this of this particular pillar is to put together what we're calling post growth deals, um, and the idea is effectively to uh, to develop a coherent policy, a, co a coherent and empirically informed policy framework that say the, the EU or a particular EU country or other country in the core could implement uh, to achieve um, you know, something approximating a, a safe and just degrowth transition, right? Uh, in a way that, that, uh, that scales down less necessary forms of production, but also um, ensures uh, strong social outcomes at the same time without the kind of disruption that normally accompanies things like recessions and so on, right? So an equitable, an equitable transition. Uh, which hasn't really been worked out yet. I mean, there's, there's lots of policy proposals out there um, which are interesting. I think there's, there's kind of a convergence that's occurring within the field around some of the core policies that would need to be implemented, like universal public services and a public job guarantee and, uh, and uh, working time reduction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's never really been put into a kind of, yeah, like a coherent economic policy framework. And that's what we want to produce from this um, for the global south, it's a little bit different. For the global, for the global south, we want to think about what kinds of policies and strategies um, governments in the global south could use to reclaim productive capacities and reorganize them around around producing for human needs and human development objectives uh, locally. Right. So again, like like it's totally nonsensical that so much of the resources and labor and lands. Uh, in the global south are mobilized around servicing accumulation in the north when they could be mobilized instead around around human needs, uh, right? Closing the, the the massive gap in social outcomes between periphery and core. But this requires, you know, um, radical approaches to to fiscal policy, to, to monetary policy, uh, to industrial policy, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to map out what that would look like as well. Um, so different strategies for different parts of the world, but... Uh, um, uh, but that's kind of the idea of this of this package, and then, and then we also have we also have um, the idea of of modeling some of these policy outcomes through, uh, say, for example, stock flow consistent models, just to see, um, you know, if you implement this kind of policy package, then what are the outcomes uh, in terms of say employment, or in terms of, um, or even more more interestingly, in terms of social outcomes and and uh, and ecological impacts and so on. So. And this is the kind of empirical data we would like to be able to present to policymakers and say, look, I mean, this is the, you know, a, a possible policy framework, and this is the, these are the, the likely effects 
given the assumptions in our models, et cetera. So at least it can start a conversation about um, about alternative trajectories. Yeah, of course, when, when you were mentioning about the the two different sets of deals, I was internally hoping that uh, you would pronounce also the term modeling. And when, when you said that, I was like, oh, that is going to be, I was thinking how hard this must be. And when you said the word, I was like, okay, uh, I'm very curious about how this is going to pan out. And does that immediately fit in with the next one with the um, service provision and the, the word package where there is more modeling or is there like an integrated model across uh, the, the spine of, uh, of the project or are these uh, smaller models that, that uh, run in parallel or how does that work? Yeah, so um, to prepare for this project, the, the ERC proposal submission, there's different rounds of selection and at some point you have to go to interview and then you have lots of people who help you out if you're lucky and we were very lucky, lots of people helped us out by asking you hard interview questions as practice. And it was Michael Jacobs who went through our proposal and was like, you guys have six different models <laughs> or seven or whatever it was. And um, we were like, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, anyway, there was not an overarching model. Uh, that is not one of our ambitions, but, be, but we'd like to advance in each direction that we're sort of trying to push forward to have at least some idea of how changing the things we're interested in changing would result in, in different outcomes. And so the, the third work package around provisioning systems is this idea of democratizing the economy, um, basically um, facing the problem that right now our political system and political decision making stops at the boundary of the quote unquote, lots of scare quotes, free market. And that basically our, democ our democratic decision making process does not go into what is extracted, produced and consumed that that's something that we're supposed to sort of let the market figure out for us. And we are supposed to only interact with it as workers and consumers, but not ever as citizens with some kind of decision-making capacity um, that, that goes beyond that. And so the, this idea of democratizing provisioning systems is basically trying to address the fact that when we look at the system of capitalism, we're looking at a global interconnected system of profit accumulation that Jason described. Um, we're looking at a macroeconomic system of finance and monetary uh, interconnectedness and how governments finance different programs and so on, which is another aspect. Um, but we're also looking at sectors uh, like the automotive industry or like the fossil fuel industry or like um, uh, the real estate and housing industry that are hugely problematic and anti-democratic in the way that they push both inequality and um, resource use. Uh, and this is something that we that if we need to to face our basically move towards a post growth future where people have better living conditions and working conditions, we need to face what those industries are doing. And so the idea of this work package is that this has to be thought through sectorally. There are a lot of ideas around democratizing the economy in general, like democratizing finance or the monetary system. But very, very few people are thinking through it sectorally, and that's what I'd like to push forward. So this is my work package. Even though I, I am not, uh, this is not my area, it's an area I've stumbled into. It's just this is what I thought needed to be um, needed to be thought about. And I think it's really, it's really quite crucial because a lot of these proposals are very naive. I think that this is also something that, you know, it's good to have proposals, it's good to have ideas. Um, but this is also something that Jason's facing in the second work package around policies, which is you have these laundry lists of policies and maybe they'll work out great or maybe they won't. But we need to understand how they're going to interact with the macro economy and how they're going to interact with each other. And the same is true for these ideas around democratizing the economy. You know, everybody's going around saying we should have worker cooperatives. OK, <laughs> um, is one size fits all ever a good solution for anything? Uh, you know, there are people who are saying we should just have commenting. OK, is, you know, so so I think it's really about having more subtlety, learning from ex existing examples and trying to have a, a more synthetic representation of the, the risks and pitfalls. And that's where the modeling comes in. So the idea of the modeling here is that we have some synthetic representation of what different decision making and institutional configurations can do across these really um, entrenched sectors and, and sort of try to represent what some 
um, differences could do in terms of social and, and environmental outcomes as opposed to others. But this this part is very challenging. I don't have a very, very good idea of how we're going to do it, let alone do it right. So I'm looking for uh, anybody who's listening to this. If you have any clever ideas, please do send them uh, that your email I will try to read. Um, that would be great. Thank you very much. Because it's just it's just very hard to think about how you represent alternative decision making in terms of sort of uh, those kinds of uh, outcomes. And I mean, uh, in your previous papers, you, you kind of reverse uh, the problem instead of having it top down, how much we consume and therefore what does it, where does the consumption end up? You, you try to reverse it and say, OK, let's let's stop a moment. Let's think about what do we really need? And what is the most efficient way to get there? Um, sorry, you want to jump in on this? Well, that's that that kind of modeling fits more in um, the kinds of modeling that we're going to be doing in Work Package One, which is around this possibilities, the material possibilities for living well within limits for 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 achieving north south convergence within planetary boundaries. This other um, this uh, so Work Package Three is much more focused on the political economy. And the organizational capacity we need to get there, because right now we have we're not in a situation where we can decide for ourselves what is being produced and what is being consumed and how we would do things differently, because we're under the decision making of very powerful, very vertically entrenched and interconnected uh, sectors that, you know, for, if you go through transportation, agri-food, um, uh, real estate Fossil and housing. Fuels, yeah. You, you're you're there you're really basically you start seeing how hard it is to 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 sort of liberate the, the an entire society from uh from the 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 imperative of overproduction and overconsumption and one of the one of the pathways for this would be giving people just democratic decision making over okay how do you want your own how do you want to run your own transportation system not just Uh, oh, by the way, we canceled all the bus services and they all suck because of chronic underfunding. And why don't you go buy a car now and get into car debt? And then you're going to have to live in a different place outside of the city because you won't be able to afford a nice place close to the city center, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so instead of sort of pitting people as consumers against these systems, let's try to pit ourselves as organized citizens. Yeah. And, and these are, uh, I guess we're going to come back to this, to the fifth pillar, which is participation or practical implementation, I, I guess that these are fora that will also come hand in hand into th thinking of this or uh, because I, I guess as a citizen, it's hard to imagine w because we're stripped so much of our possibilities and of, of our freedom to choose. Today, we, we, we don't have the practice or the muscle to, to, to rethink what, what is our extent of control, agency and participation in these discourses. So I can imagine this ties with work package five. Uh, is that uh, the case or work package five is also throughout the, the project where we also talk about the, the policies and the, the possibilities or how do you envision participation in, in all of this? Your guess, do you want to pick uh, that one up or? Participation, you mean of stakeholders and public or? Work package five and bringing things into practice. Yeah, I, I mean, think yes. we each have different sort of ideas of how we'd really love to do that. So, but go, go but it's on. Also your... It's also tagged as a research action project, and so I imagine you want to and a transdisciplinary one. So, of course, it's a, a highly yeah, yeah, yeah. ambitious no, no, element. That's fine, right? but you, you jumped from the work package three to five. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> whether you were asking something else or. Uh, So you, you skipped mine, you know, so I was preparing. To we'll, we'll come to that. Don't worry. You were following a pattern. And <laughs> I know, I know, but I like to put something in the wheels, you know. I'm not very flexible. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, the general idea there was that we wanted to somehow put these ideas in in the test of uh, reality of real processes, political processes, participatory processes. I mean, we have to admit that when we were doing the proposal, it was probably the least well thought part of it because... The rest of the project were the core questions that each one of us has come up over time and the ones where we felt they would most benefit from the collaboration of the three of us. The, the last one on participation was a, a desire that we all shared, but not somewhere where it has been the core of our research, at least not, not recently, although we all want our research to be 
relevant and uh, also inform action and fewer, if not fewer action. Um, so in that we are still open. We, we, we are not set on what we're going to do. We know that uh, we want to create uh, processes where our knowledge is um, put to the test of people, to the evaluation of people, of stakeholders, and uh, and we see where it goes, processes of co-production of knowledge. Um, on my part, I mean, what, what I want to do is to see to what extent some of the ideas um, we will be developing can inform uh, processes of local planning, uh, participatory planning at a more local scale, at a municipal scale, or at something that is uh, dear to my heart as a Greek to the island scale because we have to we are three researchers now at ICTA that in one way or the other uh, we are interested in islands I, I was going to say in one way or the other we are Greeks no we are all three <laughs> Greeks and we are all three interested in one way or the other uh, <laughs> on islands and we were thinking that it's a nice scale nice local scale a uh, small scale bounded scale uh, in one in which in different islands we have developed uh, relations and research collaborations over time where we could try at the pilot um, scale some of these ideas and see whether they make sense for local communities, whether they make sense for local decision makers, whether they can uh, offer alternatives to futures of um, over tourism and commodification and commercialization. So. So this is one scale, the islands, the other is like the small municipalities or bigger municipalities here in Catalonia or elsewhere. Uh, we are not 100% set on the cases yet uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to find cases where the demand to do something in the direction of post-growth is coming from the authorities there rather than us trying to find somewhere to do it, you know, because my experience, my much old uh, back in the past experience a little bit with participatory science participatory planning processes that uh, if the, if there is no, if it's not coming the demand from from the people on the ground and it's you as a scientist going there and trying to to move things it doesn't really work well so right now we have contacts with at least two or three islands that they are very promising that uh, there are important people there interested uh, to try and see how input from our science can inform local post-growth planning processes. And also with a medium uh, scale uh, municipality here in Catalonia where the new authorities are quite progressive and uh, they want to try some of these ideas. Ideally, I would say, I mean, but again, this is an ideal. I'm, I'm not promising it, but ideal, uh, I would like us to develop like some kind of procedural blueprint for using post-growth ideas um, to develop plans towards post-growth at the local level. S something similar to the Donut Economics Labs, um, mm. but not in terms of the Donut, more in terms of the ideas that we are more interested in, which is about post-growth transition, justice uh, within and between uh, uh, places, etc. Of course, the the island idea is very dear to my heart as well. Uh, and uh, you're Greek too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you are. I know you are. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> and with the paper, I mean, sorry, you have the, the three of you have a tradition to just publish banger papers uh, month after month, and it's hard to keep up. But of course, the one on Icaria is very close to my heart. So yeah, uh, if I had to choose one, uh, it's out of. Uh, contextual rather than, uh, of course, uh, just the merit of everything that you all have done. Um, okay, let me just revert back to order before we go to some uh, more broader questions. Um, so sorry, I, I broke the pattern of going through the list of uh, work packages. Let me just go back to normal. <laughs> and we missed the final P, the P. Number uh, four. Number yeah, exactly. Four. <laughs> of course, this is about politics. So I guess politics are not... Uh, the, the sexiest one, but uh, please make them sexy, Yorgos. Uh, you want to explore the types of political movements to realize these post-growth visions. Uh, yeah, because it's a main obstacle. I mean, politics, uh, even some uh, conservative analysts now or liberal analysts 
are saying, yeah, okay, this post growth or the growth makes sense, but politically it's 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 a non-starter. So and it's such a huge change that we can't imagine it happening in the current liberal democracies where you can just get like marginal changes in this with a lot of sweat and then they are reversed. And it's true. I mean, this critique is very true. So we want to work with it. And um, we are working with it by looking at three scales. We're looking at the scale of uh, movements, what movements are struggling and in what ways and when are they effective to open up spaces uh, alternatives to capitalist growth. So Even here you mean activism, name. you mean... Uh... I mean activism, yeah, I mean activism. Yeah, yeah. I mean social political movements, but um, but we are interested in movements that they're not just social, they're also social political. I mean, they have an ambition to change also, to take political power uh, in one way or the other. One might think of trade unions, might think of the municipalist movement, might think of organizations in food sovereignty, etc. The second scale that we are interested in is uh, institutional politics and party politics operating mostly at the national scale. So on political parties, on government, that they have flirted with um, ideas close to the ones we are exploring. And then what is the experience from these political efforts? Where did they stumble? What are the obstacles they face? Uh, how could they be strengthened? And then the third big question where we don't have the expertise, and I don't think there is much expertise around, but it should be part of the question, is geopolitics. Mm. So in what sense uh, the current changes or changes or non-changes in the world order, how are they opening or closing uh, opportunities for trying different economic futures in different places and, and generally the way the world system is organized in terms of power politically institutionally how does this um, prohibit post-growth political projects and how this might change this obviously links to the more material economic analysis that jason is performing in terms of unequal exchange it's it's a counterpart i would say mm -hmm. it's a political counterpart and of course, as you were mentioning it, I was thinking of the the policy deals that Jason was mentioning just before about how does that interfere with the political movements. Uh, Jason, you were invited also recently to the to the Dutch Parliament. You well during the Beyond Conference, you were also part of the plenary session, uh, also the other sessions. Uh, I don't know how much you can share, of course, but. Uh, what are some of your feelings when you are invited in, in these venues? What are the type of discussions when we have to compare them with just uh, what Yorgos mentioned, right? So where, what is the, are they just curious? They want to learn what the opposition has to say in order to be prepared and to, to balance uh, arguments. Uh, is it a new way to, to present an agenda? Do they feel that uh, this is a, an opportunity or something that they need to invest uh, upon? Or w what is your feeling when when you speak with uh, politicians and parliaments in, in these fields? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm, I'm still trying to process this myself a little bit, but my sense is from, from closed door meetings that have occurred, say, after I spoke at the Dutch parliament and so on, my my sense is that politicians on the left and the green the Green parties, the progressive Green parties in particular, are, are are clearly aware that that existing approaches are not working, and are are also are, are are eager for alternative pathways. And I think that they're increasingly open to post growth ideas, because they see that's where the energy is at, and that's where ideas are coming from. And so they want to learn about it, right? But they're also terrified because <laughs> because they're not sure like what kinds of you know what kinds of narratives are gonna are gonna make this possible. Um, what kinds of political movements? You know, will this require, et cetera? And so I think that they're they're kind of in an exploratory phase is, is the sense that I have. Um, but I think that the more we're able to unite uh, social and ecological problems and solutions together, the more it makes sense for them, right? Because there's just no way that any politician on the left uh, can legitimately go out and talk about and talk about degrowth um, without, you know, without uh, 
clearly triggering the massive uh, sense of insecurity that huge numbers of people under capitalism live under, right? Live with constantly. And so there, there has to be a strong social policy platform that is going to, um, that is going to assuage those concerns. Like we have to fundamentally address the question of economic insecurity, the question of, of structural unemployment, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And only then can we really have a, like a rational conversation about what to do about ecology and, and you know, radical climate action, et cetera. So they're, they're looking for that synthesis, I think. Uh, and my sense is once they uh, are able to see that, then th there's potentially quite a lot of, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of potential, I suppose, in, uh, in a popular post-growth deal that could emerge. And I think they see that, um, but, there, but there's still convincing to do. And I think that's, that's, that's where this project comes in, right? Like, like they want to know um, how it's going to work, uh, you know, what the empirics look like, um, and so on. I think that's a, like what we'd ultimately like to provide to kind of, uh, what should I say, kind of expand the Overton window of what's politically possible. Um, but ultimately, I think that we're all very clear on one fact, which is that uh, it doesn't really matter what's empirically possible. Of course, that's important for us as scientists. But um, but uh, but the possibility of a post-growth deal or a post-growth transition um, rests entirely on the balance of class power and the balance of political forces. And so the social movements and political movements that are uh, that are necessary to achieve such a transition against the interests, as Julia mentioned, of uh, the oligarchic ruling class who benefits so prodigiously from the status quo, those movements have to be built. And that's, and that's, uh, that's not a small task. And right now those movements don't exist in the form that they need to. Uh, and that's, um, I think that's really what's, what's going to have to occupy all of us for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Of course, um, what's something that is, uh, missing is this, uh, either social acceptance or mass push from, uh, labor movements and uh, from uh, uh, well uh, from the labor movement in general yeah but i was thinking also if we mobilize the concept of environmentalism of the poor from um have you discussed with any parliaments uh, in africa in latin america and other parliaments have i mean you and in general in your laboratories as well yorgos perhaps we can go there later on are they are there any laboratories that you would like to 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 experiment uh, with or together? Uh, um, well, on on the other side of the plundering, let's say. So, Jason, I don't know if you have discussed with parliaments elsewhere than than Europe, and what's their take on all of this? Are they also open, or the discussion of well, uh, development is very much the the prevalent one, and these go to the to the side. Well, I think it's clear that, I mean, there's something happening, uh, you know, a across the global south that's disrupting the balance of geopolitical power a little bit right now, right? I mean, you can see this emerging from some of the Latin American governments who are now questioning, uh, you know, their reliance on uh, the, the, the currencies of the core, and specifically the U.S. dollar. You're looking at, like, more regional trade integration, um, and so on, and that's I think interesting. I think increasingly, you know, there's there's kind of a resurgence uh, politics in the global south that is gaining steam right now, and um, and they're experimenting with new ideas around industrial policy and monetary policy a little bit. Uh, but I would also caution that this is <clears throat> this is very early days, and we'll see how the core powers respond. I mean, it's it's always a really this is a tricky situation. Um, but in general, that's, I mean, that's, that's primarily the focus uh, right now in terms of radical politics in the South, at least the government level, is, is to think about that, like how to overcome the obstacles they face in an imperialist world economy. Um, in terms of social movements, I think that there's, yeah, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, and mobilization around, um, you know, pushing against extractivism by foreign by foreign multinational companies uh, and the kind of ecological harms that that, you know, inflicts on on communities across the global south. Uh, so, uh, so there's different kind of factions of these of this discontent, I suppose, that that we see. Yeah, and and you're also in the 
Uh, sorry, Julia, you wanted also to, to chime in? Yeah, because uh, I realized that we didn't talk about one of the things that I'm most excited about in terms <laughs> of these global north and global south um, pathways and also the policy proposals and sort of trying to explore these, these different things, which is I think um, we're going to be able to do some labor footprinting, which is something that a lot mm. of people are doing, but we'd like to really integrate that with uh, this question of what lifestyle changes in the global north would look like in terms of you know reducing resource use and then what that frees up when we get rid of um, for instance unequal debt uh, and unequal exchange in the global south and we can sort of see you know who's going to work for who so who is currently working for who what is the appropriation of global south labor in the global north through our overconsumption right now and how that could flip and how the global south countries might be able to reinvest in their own uh uh, living conditions, much safer, much more prosperous living conditions. So this idea of integrating labor, um, because everybody is always saying, oh, well, you know, the global north's overconsumption is just generosity because we're employing the global south, which is, <laughs> you know, bullcrap. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, you know, but wrong. basically put some numbers and some modeling into that. And I think that that's going to help change the narrative and the perception of what a post-growth future could look like, because I think a lot of people are afraid of for jobs and livelihoods. And so just sort of pointing the way towards what that alternative could look like, I think would be quite exciting. And maybe another thing I'd, I'd like to say is in terms of this work package five and going into practice is that one of the things I'm excited to do is to try to initiate dialogues with political parties, you know, maybe here in Switzerland and also with uh, international diplomacy. So there are groups of international diplomats at the various UN locations. And one of them is in Geneva, which is not far from where I am. And so basically try to start um, these discussions around, okay, what does an alternative, uh, what do alternatives look like? Who is interested in this? Um, and and what feedback do you have? What do you like? What do you not like? What do you, what do you, what more questions do you have? What questions would need to be answered for you to go back to your governments and, and actually propose this uh, or to your political parties and go back and propose this? So I think really just starting these, 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 I, these dialogues to sort of spread the ideas out and test the ideas against people who rely on um, basically convincing, you know, convincing their populations that this is something worth going for. I think that that's gonna that's something that I'm really looking forward to doing in this project. Yeah, I had um, Yamina Saeb as well on the podcast, and she was mentioning how she wanted to initiate sufficiency diplomacy. So they did this first sufficiency summit between uh, France and uh, Australia through these diplomatic ties. So I'm curious to see how that goes indeed. Uh, like, uh, what are some best practices that can then be also pushed through diplomacy, kind of showcasing how post-growth is this new, um, um, well, element that you want to push as, as value, you know, as, 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 a, as a national value that you want to, to have solidarity and you want to share with the rest of the world how you managed in your own context to implement it. So I would be very curious, yeah, to, to see how that goes. Um, just for these case studies, and I'm wondering, so Yorgos, you mentioned some islands, perhaps some municipality in, uh, uh, in Catalonia, perhaps some other islands uh, that uh, we, they will be identified also in the future. Do you have also counterparts um, in rural areas, uh, in areas that are industrial or extractive and how they will change no, these their are, these are lifestyles? Not case study. These are not case mm. studies. Sorry, let's not confuse it. So we're not mm -hmm. doing any case studies of post-growth. What we said is we want to try a little bit and develop some. Mm. This is part of something we wanted at the beginning and establish some dialogues at different levels with diplomats, mm. said Julia, I said with local communities. But the, the point is not to try different communities and see how. So it's not a research there. It's more like piloting processes to see how our ideas could could be part of a planning process at the local level. Uh, so in that sense, it doesn't matter what type of community it is, you know, because it, we are piloting the process. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, or we learn something from it. Uh, but it's not an effort to do case studies of post-growth processes or anything like that. Just to make clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I'm just asking this. I also have a friend who wants to to see, uh, to experiment with what he calls untraceable uh, cities or territories which have no, almost no impact to the environment and see how little, I mean, how can you reduce to an absolute minimum to everything and go to these degraded places 
uh, landscape of extraction, landscapes of pollution, and at the same time restore them and have kind of a post-growth lifestyle. So I thought of uh, him and his project um, when I was asking this uh, particular question. Um, so we have, we now have the five Ps that will fertilize the the soil and then bring uh, new new ideas. Perhaps just some general questions before we wrap this up. Um, of course, there is one element which is dear to, to my heart, which is urban areas or territories and how does this land in territories. And um, lastly, I, I discussed with uh, Federico Savini, who works on post-growth cities and, uh, and degrowth cities and tries to implement that. And we're discussing uh, a number of what we have just said today and how uh, how we implement them in cities. So how do we take back the, play, the, the land from, let's say, fossil fuel um, infrastructures and then convert it into something else? How do we definancialize the built environment uh, and not make it as a spatial fix, etc., uh, etc.? Cetera, et cetera. And I was thinking if we have to reverse engineer it once again, uh, I think, and we don't have a lot of empirical studies into this. That's why I'm asking to, to you three, perhaps you have already given a thought to this. The, the easiest way forward for, for me was when reading uh, one of your, the, the decent energy standards, uh, Julia, where you mentioned what were some of the square meters that would be decent for everyone. I think it was 15 square meters per person plus five of communal space or something like that. And I tried to say, okay, so if I take the case of Brussels, I think they have 45 million square meters of residential space. Uh, and it's 1.1 million. So let's say one by having the 20 square meters, we have almost half. We can reduce by half the square meters of residential um, footage. And I'm thinking about cities and a number of territories where we just have too much, right? We have just too much stocks. And just because we have too much stocks, we need to maintain them. And these will uh, perpetuate uh, more consumption and unequal in, uh, consumption. So something needs to be reimagined in the existing, not in the future, not in the new, but in the existing. And I'm, and I'm. Do you have any ideas about what? How do we scale down from the existing? We sacrifice. We, we. Well, we put away. Or what are some of the steps with perhaps of where you live right now? You know, in in your physical territories. What are some um, if we were to take some of the potential outcomes of your projects in six years' times and apply them in where you live, what what's, can we do this exercise uh, and think about what will change in your in Lausanne and in Barcelona, let's say? Um, Julia, do you want to? Yeah. So actually, there's a colleague here who's uh, uh, Sasha Nick, who's also working with Philip mm. Talman on a on a joint project who's, uh, and so you, you know all of these people since they're at EPFL, and doing some sort of uh, calculations and saying, listen, we don't need new buildings, we need to repurpose existing buildings so that people have this flexibility of, you know, changing their living space, changing their overconsumption of living space. Now, I'm not, um, I really want people to, I, I hear a lot of people saying, hey, we need to implement this 15 square meter thing. Um, <laughs> It's a first model. It's a very simple model. We made our lives, you know, we, as Joel Milward Hopkins, who, who led the work, uh, had to do a lot of simplification. And, you know, for instance, one of the things that's over simple in this model is 20 year, 20 degrees year round, which is a comfortable temperature, both for cold and hot. But you could bring the temperature down to 18 degrees in colder climates and still be comfortable and safe in terms of your living conditions. And you can raise that temperature in hotter climates to something like 26 degrees and still be okay. So that's already one thing where one of the reasons we get to 15 meters is because of this 20 degree thing. If you change the temperature, you get to more space, right? So don't, don't take any of this stuff as religious. Model it for yourselves, people. And, the, and then this idea, but I think that we have to take seriously this idea that in current urban situations, uh, one of the things we need to face is the real estate sector and the construction sector and their um, imperatives, their growth imperatives around always building new stuff, as opposed to doing the much more necessary, socially and environmentally necessary work of retrofitting existing and making the existing living spaces a lot more flexible. 
because that's one of the things in the UK, for instance, uh, which is actually I know better than Switzerland uh, for, for various reasons. I was there for longer. The In the UK, you're stuck with two bedroom houses, two bedroom apartments, three bedroom houses, three bedroom apartments. Well, actually the two bedroom apartments. And you have very little studio space and you have very little one bedroom space. And um, even the two bedroom space, I think, is a bit limited in terms of uh, the, the sort of terraced housing. And so people, uh, because of smaller household sizes, would quite like to move into those kinds of spaces, but they just don't exist. So I think it's a, it's a lot of this creative arch architecture around taking the existing built stock and turning it into something that suits the needs of changing household sizes or also has this idea of co-housing and turning, you know, not always having to build new co-housing developments, but taking ex ex existing building stocks and creating communal spaces, communal guest rooms, communal playrooms, the kinds of things that are very attractive in eco-housing or co-housing right now, how do you do that? That's the real architecture challenge. And the other one is around the space, you know, giving space back from cars, so repro rep repossessing the car space and turning that into parks, into living space, into recreation space. I think that that's really, really important. And you use the word sacrifice, which um, I think is is right now we're being asked to sacrifice a livable planet. So I always like to put that sacrifice front and center. I think it's probably the most important one. Like, you know, we're just not going to be able to live in any kind of de decent stability in any kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the billion, you know, millions and millions and millions of people, possibly billions will be dying on our current trajectory. That's not good. Let's keep that sacrifice in mind for front and center. So I think it's more about trade-offs. And I think that the one of the things we always have to put forward is the increase in quality of life that we gain from uh, changing the our provision of basic needs away from the sort of market-based every individual for themselves to the sort of more common, you know, universal public services, public, um, public luxury, private frugality type of picture. And I think that putting forward what we gain is really important. Uh, I've been asked a couple of times by people to tell us more about your renunciation ideology. And I'm just like, right, this is an email I will not answer right now because <laughs> that is not, you know, when you choose that framing, you're already, you're already um, admitting defeat to some extent. Uh, so I think it's really, it's really much more about saying, okay, this is the parameter space that we have and we can go forward in a very different way. Um, in terms of the north-south uh, convergence, uh, Jason, do you see any change in a territory once we we converge in the future? W would that radically change a number of uh, elements that you will f see around you in, in your city and in your territory or something uh, different that you will um, envision uh, in terms of territories thanks to this convergence? Well, uh, yeah, so, so I grew up in in Eswatini in Southern Africa. And uh, I mean, even just a cursory visit to that, to that country will reveal um, how messed up, you know, uh, the world economy is and the integration of the South into it. Uh, in, in Eswatini, I mean, it's very productive land. And it's, uh, and there's a huge portion of that territory that's given away to, that's given over to producing uh, sugarcane under extremely exploitative conditions. Um, and the land is owned and controlled by, by British companies now. And it's not so different actually from under colonialism. Uh, meanwhile, a huge, a huge portion of the population uh, cannot access even the most basic nutrition. I mean, think about this, right? Talk about a massive misuse of land. And so um, it's not difficult to imagine how a, a different arrangement of the economy, which allowed countries like Eswatini to have more control over their own productive capacities through more monetary and fiscal sovereignty would be able to remobilize that land around meeting human needs uh, domestically and and I mean end poverty in a very short period of time I mean really like the kinds of uh, the kinds of production that is necessary to end poverty is actually really not difficult to do we're talking about uh, we're talking about houses you know electricity sanitation systems uh, nutrition you know clinics schools, most of this kind of production can be done with domestic materials and labor. It's not rocket science, actually. It's simply a matter of being able to reappropriate and reclaim productive capacities and reorganize it. And uh, and so, you know, this this discourse is out there that poverty is this intractable problem, intract, intractable problem and will take generations to solve, if ever. Totally wrong. 
uh, it can be addressed more or less immediately. I mean, very, very quickly. And we've seen this happen before under revolutionary conditions. Uh, and, um, and that's the kind of aspiration that I think we should have now. And, uh, um, and so under a scenario where we achieve the kinds of transformations that we, that we discuss and model in, in this work, that's the kind of change you would see happen very quickly. Uh, and I think that's incredibly inspiring. Yeah, th this is very n nicely also complementing what Julia mentioned about the, it's not about uh, sacrificing, but also all of the fantastic possibilities that we have when we <laughs> when we take out the shackles. And, and your goes perhaps to, to finish in terms of the political side of, of things, wh where do you, do, do you see any, I mean, of course, uh, I'm not talking necessarily about parties or, but the way that democratic processes will take place in, in this post-growth uh, territory, how will, how will this take, uh, I mean, how we, you, will you experience it in your, in your practice, in your life? Uh, would you have different levels of, uh, of choices that you need to take? Uh, some, some resources need to be dealt at a certain levels and democratically we figure out what is the, 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 the urgency that we need to tackle together. Or have you, Do you wonder from time to time what uh, will this look like uh, in the future? Yeah, I wonder, uh, and I, <laughs> I, I worry. <laughs> I worry it might not look at all like that. It might look like uh, or urban uh, in Hungary, uh, all over Europe and in the mm. U.S. You know, so it's it's more likely scenario where people like seventy percent of the population doesn't vote, the other thirty percent votes dedicatedly and votes right wing and far right <laughs> on equal on equal <laughs> uh, proportions and then there is a opposition that is just liberal which is <laughs> which is the problem also today so uh, so there is a very bad scenario and it's unfolding so it's a little bit hard for me to i mean i am utopian but not too utopian you know so i don't <laughs> want to to think too far away i mean the reality right now is that there is a turn to to right slash far right in Europe and it has to be stopped. And the other reality is that within the, the radical left and even within social Democrats, uh, there are people open to our ideas. So the immediate, the immediate priority is how these voices and generally how there will be a space reserved for social Democrats and the, the radical left and the Greens. And then within these spaces, how our ideas are, are, are are going to be accepted and perhaps with some few enlightened uh, liberals or or conservatives that they are open also to to think differently so that i mean immediately within within the current system then of course the current system of democracy has uh, liberal democracy has many problems has led to a generalized apathy uh, and this is a problem so the, again the immediate challenge is how to stop this apathy i mean you know in my in When I was growing up in Greece, like uh, elections were a big thing. 90% of people were voting. And I remember everyone being out with flags. Now you were going with your car and you had the flag of the party you were voting. <laughs> and then there were souvlaki being grilled everywhere. <laughs> and uh, the souvlaki also had their own flag. So it was like a big thing, you know. And then I, I read that in these elections where, of course, right plus far right triumph to 52%, which is unprecedented uh, In recent Greek history, only 40% of the population voted. So it's uh, it's a huge reduction. It's less than. I remember 80 to 90 was like f taken for granted in Greece. Uh, I, I don't I don't know when this started changing, but definitely I think it's it's recent. And 40% is demoralizing, which means that this system is no longer really democratic. It's like a small minority of people, and for the grand majority of people, it doesn't mean anything. So why don't they vote? Not because they are ignorant or lazy, but because they probably rightly think that whoever is elected doesn't make a big difference for them. Um, probably for the worst. I mean that they are all equal. They are they are all equally bad. So the challenge again, therefore, progressive in progressive in the sense of uh, socialist, eco-socialist forces, is to really prove that they can make a difference and. Uh, motivate again people and take them out with flags and have again a real class of ideas 
Yeah, ideally after, yes, we, we need much more decentralized democracy. We need to be involved politically, not just every four years when we vote. We need more opportunities for a direct input. We need more assemblies. We need more, yeah, but that's that's a little bit too far right now, I think, compared to where we stand. Mm. Well, of course, we also need to to remind that in Greece there was also a, a history of dictatorships. And after that, I mean, the, the left and the right were not just left and the right. <laughs> there were heavily political stances that uh, uh, stained uh, many generations after that. So, and Yeah, but people believed that there would be a change, you know, because to mm. go out, I mean, I remember going out with a car and like beeping honking, your horn yeah. and <laughs> honking, celebrating who won. Because you thought that this would make a difference in your life, and actually, you know, when when a socialist, uh, I, I guess I'm older than you, so I can remember. So I remember when a socialist government, for the first time, a left wing government, was elected in Greece in 1981, and it was not just honking because uh, the guy was uh, Papandreou with all his problems later, but because there were there were like real differences in your life. I mean, I remember my parents were working six days and he was elected and they were working five days and then Saturday we were all sitting home taking it easy. So it wasn't just theoretical that we just liked Papa Andreou because he was better uh, in the public uh, debate on the television or, you know, because he he was nicer in the morning chats, like it's what's happening today. It was like the next day, yes, we were working less. In in the school, in the uh, I was in the elementary school and they were still beating us up. I mean, I remember being slapped and I was a good student, as you can imagine, for being a professor today, right? Uh, but I received a lot of be uh, beating. In, in the... Papa Andreou elected next day, it's forbidden to, to hit anyone. Uh, rights to, to women, you know, they, they, they weren't anywhere in Greece before. So, you know, salaries, political positions for women, all these things were real differences, material differences. So they, they weren't symbolic. I mean, they were to a large extent also symbolic, but they were also real. And I think this is what is missing today. Like to vote someone and really the next day, day or the next month say, okay, this made a difference to my life. I'm going to vote them again, you know, and again and again, I'm going to take also a flag for them. And also on your souvlaki, yeah. And the souvlaki as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, we're vegetarians. We're not eating sort of like yeah, yeah. Uh, falafels. We don't um, have falafels in Greece, but something like that. Yeah. So just to wrap up, um, so many great uh, elements that I, well, that now the world expects from you. So we, we in one year, we'll be, uh, you know, knocking on your doors and, uh, and hoping for solutions and... Uh, and having everything ready for us. Uh, do you have, in the meantime, in, uh, anything for us to, to read, to listen, to watch? Do you have any inspiring or not inspiring, uh, you know, uh, song, book, uh, article, movie, something that you would like to, to share uh, for us to be patient? I just finished listening to a very good podcast. Uh, so I'm just saying the last thing I did, but I really liked it. So it's from, uh, it's called, uh, let me see that. I think the podcast is called, it's a Jacobin ma magazine podcast. Uh -huh. It's called The Dive, I believe. And it had a great one on artificial intelligence. It was like such a pleasure to listen. There were like three Marxists, one of them previously <laughs> working for Google, just deconstructing the whole hype and all the bullshit around artificial intelligence and how... These capitalist bros in Silicon Valley are using it. Of course, there are real changes ca happening, but how they are building up all this hype to avoid real deregulation, and also how they are doing it to, I mean, to as always, the the main objective is to slash labor rights and reduce the cost of labor. I mean, anyways, it, it was great because we hear so much about artificial intelligence, and it's all about. Uh, exterminator and uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence escaping and then I listened to some Marxists and I said okay these guys oh, really make finally. sense because <laughs> yeah. the rest somehow didn't make sense you know something was off up with it this whole narrative so please listen to it if you're worried about artificial intelligence yeah great thanks because it's also now a, a nice uh, way to postpone for climate action because AI is now the new thing to to worry about somehow um Julia, Jason, anything the, that you've read, listened, or watched that you would like to share? Uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll go next. So um, in terms of research, because you said, what can people expect? I think this is a good place to say that there's lots of other research projects on degrowth and post-growth coming down the line and existing. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm going to fail to list all the ongoing projects, but uh, there is a 2B, which involves Dan O'Neill and Milena Bux and other fabulous people. There is the WISE project led by Rutger Hoekstra on alternative indicators. It's not particularly degrowth post-growth, but at least moving away from TDP. Um, there's uh, Mario Pancera has a project on post-growth business models. Uh, Simone D'Alessandro is continuing his fabulous modeling work. And one of the big challenges we have is we have to work, we want to work with all these people. We are not, we refuse to compete. We want to work with. Um, and so uh, this, this is something that is a, is a challenge for us right now, is to think about how we can best collaborate across this fantastic research landscape in Europe right now. And there's going to be more and more of this research coming down the line, and we really have to sort of federate ourselves, because um, I think Simona D'Alessandro, we were speaking in Brussels, and he said, we have one chance, mm. and this is it. So we have one of the ways, one of the, the burdens on us is to not mess this up, is to really work together. So I just wanted to say that as well. Um, the the other thing uh, in terms of recommending reading uh, or listening, everybody needs to read The Nutmeg's Curse by uh, Amitav Ghosh. Everybody, everybody, this is um, a really good book. And one of the reasons it's a really good book is because he does things like cite Jason a lot and Robin Walkemer <laughs> and other people. So, uh, you know, you, 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 you get a lot of thinking condensed into one fantastically readable book. So please do get, do yourself a favor this summer and read that. Fantastic. Jason? I'm glad, you, I'm glad that Julia mentioned the other projects because I was going to say the same. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's lots of people who, who are doing this and and, uh, and and really like it's actually too big to keep track of. <laughs> it's it's funny. Uh, a couple of years ago, I felt like there's, there's so few people working in this space. I mean, even at the time, it was actually pretty big. But but now, I mean, it's just it's overwhelming and very exciting. And uh, and I feel it's, it's encouraging somehow now. <laughs> it's like um, we have a lot of solidarity and companionship in the research community towards the objectives that we share so that's that's great um in terms of books that have or texts that have inspired me i mean uh i i guess since i've been talking a lot about the world system i'll just mention one book that i think is very good on that which is uh it's called capital and imperialism by by patnaik and patnaik two indian economists um who have who have taught me a lot, and I really owe uh, a lot of my insights to to their work. Uh, so, and then there's also an, there's a, a Senegalese economist called um, Ndongo Sambasila, who I think is doing amazing work, uh, thinking about um, uh, about what global south governments and social movements can can do to uh, to achieve more freedom, uh, more economic freedom within their um, within their position in the world economy and that's that's to me also very inspiring well my it's good that i'm going on holiday so i have time to read all of that um thanks so much uh, once again i mean it was fantastic uh, next time let's try to to do this in person i think in one year time the the ecological economics uh, uh, conference will be with mario pancera in pontevedra uh, and I think it's combined with the International Degrowth Conference. So, in one year time, let's uh, let's reconvene to 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 talk about progress and to to discuss uh, new exciting opportunities and new exciting readings. Thanks so much, uh, Julia, Yorgos, Jason, for this fantastic discussion. Thanks as well to to all of you for listening, watching. Um, yeah, I think there is a number of elements that we discussed. You can you can go back to the episode with. Um, Raj Patel on uh, on cheap nature, cheap labor, with Jason Moore on the capital scene, uh, Tim Jackson, you mentioned him, uh, Julia, on the post-growth as well. So, yeah, uh, there is such a vibrant community, and I, I want to thank you once again for, for this, for making this happen and for this discussion as well. Thank you, Aristide. Thanks, Aristide. Thanks very much for having us. Great. That's a wrap.